Welcome to Megan and the Thunderdome, a citizen assembly meeting where we test ideas and hone debate skills in a real life social political arena with the goal of holistic balance. If you'd like to participate, find out how in our podcast description. So we are going to begin with a round of introduction from our panelists. So we each have about 30 seconds apiece to tell the group and our listeners a little bit about us, such as where we're from and where our field of interest is. So I will start us off. My name is Megan and I'm currently in San Antonio, Texas. And my primary field of interest is restoring the family, largely through education values and nutrition. I will now go over to Stacy. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Stacy Gustafson, and I am part of the Universal Community Project, which is a 360 degree platform for, for holistic community problem solving. Thanks very much. Thank you for being here, Stacy. Darren, thank you so much for joining us. We're very happy to have you here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I'll say a little bit. Uh, so I'm Darren. Uh, I'm currently a graduate student in philosophy in Toronto. And uh, my main interests are in political philosophy, but I'm you know, interested in a lot of different things. Um, and um, yeah, and I run the Toronto Philosophy Meetup where we uh, host some of uh, Cesare's events or this group's events. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Darren. I'll now go over to Dan Bader. Would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Dan Bader, uh, based in Chicago. Um, and uh, I, I work for the Chicago Department of Public Health, retired in 2016. My interests are public health, mental health. Uh, you know, currently, uh, and, and for the past couple of years, abrupt climate change and uh, bioweapons and now, you know, COVID-19 and the vaccination situation takes up a lot of my energy. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here, Dan. I'll now go over to Daniel. Daniel Tweed, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, Daniel Tweed. I'm a two-time past candidate for the Thousand Oaks City Council here in Ventura County, California, and planning to run again in 2022, mostly on the platform that governments are woefully uh, under-equipped or ignoring major existential threats to human life and civilization. And I, I'm also um, planning to enter the Gigaton Carbon, remo carbon Removal Prize, the X Prize for removing carbon. And I agree with Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk that we need to become a multi-planetary species. And I'll be presenting my campaign at the street fair in Thousand Oaks, October 17th. I have a booth there next to the Conejo Valley Makers. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Hope you can make it up here to Thousand Oaks for that. That's awesome, Daniel. Okay, we'll go over to Ilya. Would you please introduce yourself? Yes, hi, my name is Ilya. So I'm from uh, Kiev, Ukraine. I'm an engineer and uh, I'm interested in a lot of things, but uh, one of them is markets, exchanges, cryptocurrencies, and, and incentives. Thank you. Did Megan freeze? Uh -huh. Yes, it looks like Megan froze. We had um, some real weather here in Texas. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue with the introduction. So, so next we'll go to Alex. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Kratz. I'm currently located in the Chicago area and I'm interested in science and technology and I look forward to tonight's discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for being here, Alex. And we can now go over to Vilo or Vilo. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but 
please introduce yourself. You got it the right. You got it right the first time. <laughs> okay, Velo. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Vidal, but you call me Velo. Um, I'm from Orlando, and I'm currently working for a nonprofit organization that helps um, migrants from other countries settle in the U.S. Um, I'm also the host of uh, the Philosophy Shop 2.0. Uh, my main interest is in philosophy and politics, and um, I, I, I'm really active, <laughs> so I'm actually um, enjoying our chats here. So it's um, I'm looking forward to having a nice, lively discussion. That's all. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Velo. And nice to meet you for the first time. And welcome to Thunderdome for the first time, too. All right. If I'm not mistaken, we have covered everybody. And we will now begin the present. Oh, except for Cesari. I almost forgot you, Cesari. Maybe that was on purpose. But go ahead. <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. Uh, right. Uh, hello, everybody. Cesare Urevic from the great nation of USA, residing just on the outskirts of Chicago. My main interest as a thinker, that's ethics and economics. My main concern as an activist, that's animal liberation and social and economic justice. And I'm very excited to be talking about today's topic. It's going to be fun. All right. Me too. This is, yeah, I'm really excited for this discussion to see where it goes. So we're going to go ahead and get into the presentation of the idea. So today I'm presenting an idea that is called good and evil don't exist. And this idea has been written up to share with others in Agora, which is the worldwide stock market of ideas, which you can find at agora-ilp.org. Agora is an online platform where people from around the world can turn their ideas into policy to build a better world. So I will start screen sharing and I will proceed with the reading of the idea. I will also link it in the chat too when I'm finished. Very short and simple. So good and evil don't exist. Nature or a place nature with God, if you will, did not create good and evil for those are concepts of man. Rather nature created reality and unreality. Reality is everything that the Supreme being creates. That which always has been, which is and always will be. Unreality is everything that man creates in his own mind. So very short, sweet, simple idea. I'm linking it in the chat here in case anybody would like to refer to it, but just a show of hands, who is in general agreement with this idea that good and evil don't exist? Okay, Cesari is, Velo is, I am, Stacy is. And halfway agrees. Okay, Daniel halfway agrees. So does anybody not agree? I really want to know what does halfway agree with something like that mean? But anyways, I can't wait till the discussion. Uh, okay. I, I just want to want to clear, you know, usually I'm, uh, you know, th these ideas cover actually more than one idea so frequently. In terms of this one, um, I, I uh, I, I do feel that uh, uh, good and evil are useful categories, you know, to, to look at events uh, as far as whether they actually exist or not. If that's what, if that's what you're really getting at, that, you know, where, um, you know, one man's evil can be another man's good and all. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm not saying that good and evil shouldn't ever be used because everybody is going to use them no matter what. But the point is there is no universal good and evil because it's different based off of your own personal values. So that's basically the essence of what I'm saying. And um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and move into the discussion. So would anybody like to start us off? Wait, 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 wait. I thought, what was the show of hands on who disagrees with that? I think we kind of got thrown off track there. I believe Alex and Darren, is that correct? Yeah, so Alex and Darren. So Darren's like, okay, so so. Alex does not agree. And then those who agreed was Cesari, myself, Velo, Dan, and Stacy. And then Daniel tweet also was so so. All right. Cesari, you seem excited. Would you like to start us off? Really? I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> I want you to seem eager. Uh, so okay. Well, actually, let me start breaking down the language of this idea here. Um, good and evil 
don't exist. I mean, yeah, okay, of course, right? Everybody knows that. Nature did not create good and evil. Uh, well, okay, right, of course. Those are concepts of man. I, I don't like the sexism here, you know, you talking about man, I think it should be gender, gender neutral. I have issues with that. That's, that's why I'm not a supporter of this idea, even though I agree with it. Well, not, that's not the only reason, um, but you know, that's one of the reasons. And then rather nature created reality and unreality. I don't, what? Like, so here I'm confused. Like what, what's up with this choice of words? Uh, reality is everything that the Supreme being creates. What, how did a Supreme being get into all of this? I, I don't know where that's coming from. Um, so you're kind of losing me there. And then what always has been is and will be, uh, what? Like that's, that's some grand claims that are not really justified here or necessarily connected to the original, to the main claim about good and evil. And then unreality is everything that man creates in his own mind. Against there's that whole sexism thing. Uh, and then unreality. So everything that exists in people's minds is not real. I, I disagree with that. I think mental uh, exper experiences, they're very real. And in some ways, maybe they're the most real thing there is. Maybe they're the only thing that really is. You can't really prove that there is anything other than experiences. So experiences are actually the most real thing, as far as we know. Uh, but th those are my initial thoughts. So, and, and I, I do have other ideas that I support on this subject that I think better articulate this, but I'm not going to get into that. I just wanted to say this as my opening statement. I yield the floor. Okay. Thank you, Cesare. Good points. I will come back to myself and I'll kind of clarify what some of those terms mean. But in the meantime, I'll go over to Alex. You are next. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't support the idea. Um, but that's not to say that I don't agree with the statement good and evil don't exist. I think in terms of like black and white categorizations of the world, I agree that that's not really a useful way of looking at things and things are more case by case. Uh, what really threw me off is the rest of the argument that you used to st support your claim, um, specifically the statement about what the nature of reality is, that it's everything the supreme being creates, what has always been and is and will be. I'm just confused as to how one would verify what is, uh, or, or like what's something that the Supreme Being created and what's an artifact of your mind. I, to the best of my knowledge, you know, the way you interact with the world is filtered through your brain. So it's more of a question of how do you uh, create a reference frame that's not filtered through your mind. Uh, for all I know, you know, a lot of what we're seeing could be filtered through your mind to a significant degree. And so I'm, be curious to see how you define or, or how you can point to something and say that is unreality for sure versus something else uh, without filtering it through your own mind. So yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So let me revert back to some of the terms. So in terms of, I use he to talk about uh, humans in general because woman is of man. So when I say the word man, I do mean men and women. I prefer to use that. Um, but now the supreme being some people say god i believe uh and you know nature is the supreme that, that's a kind of a different subject but what i mean by supreme being is what's out of our control so when i talk about what always has been is and will be i'm talking about the nature of reality that was here before we even got on this planet so I also want to cover the difference between believing and knowing. So there are many things we can believe, but there are a few things that we actually know. For example, uh, no, we don't actually know that Earth is a ball floating through space. It's a belief. Now, I probably shouldn't have said that because that's going to bring up other topics. So let me use another example. Um, okay, the belief that's a, yeah, uh, that's another, yeah, that's literally another topic we can do. But um, the belief that a college degree attributes to success, it doesn't actually exist. That's just a belief that was created in their own minds. Whereas something that is real, something that you can know, which is based off your senses is hunger, for example. 
you can't believe you're hungry. You just are because your stomach growls. It's the same thing like a natural diet. A cow's natural diet is grass that was there before the cow even got there. You can't change that. So reality is often found in those things that you cannot change, just like the natural human diet. You can't change that. Same thing, something else you know too, uh, the desire for sex. It's literally so you can reproduce. That is nature. That is reality. And no matter how hard you try, you can't change that. So the laws of nature are what always has been, always will be, and is right now. There are things that we can never change. So how do you prove what exists in the mind versus what is reality? Just that. Uh, what exists in your mind is something that you can't necessarily physically see. Not that, it, see, unreality can become reality, but the point is that all unreality exists in the mind. It's once again, a belief set. Another example is what's happening in the world today. I guess I, I don't really, I'm not even careful with language in this because if YouTube deletes it, whatever, but this entire pandemic only exists in the minds of the people that believe in it. So this is something like the Hegelian dialectic is a... It's basically, I'm sure many have heard of it before, but it's action, reaction, and synthesis. So how it works is you have an action. So you have the pandemic, right? This mass sickness, this virus that is infecting people. So then the natural reaction to that is fear in the population. They are fearful, they are afraid, and they become submissive. And because we've removed the strong fathers and strong family as a backbone of society there doesn't really exist anymore for most people so then they go they're more dependent on the government now so now the synthesis is mandated vaccinations or more government restrictions more government dependency we see stimulus checks going out now the average americans 30 percent of their income comes from the government so that is a synthesis but how the hegelian dialectic works is that the same institution that imposes the synthesis also imposes the cost too so it's actually genius but i say that example so you can see that that also is unreality it doesn't actually exist it's just a collective belief that people hold but reality is in nature and that's something you can never change i yield for now dan bader so uh, some thoughts um, you know, so it, good and evil, again, they're, they're categories, they're, they're categories. And uh, uh, yet things which are considered to be evil, uh, you know, there, there's certain characteristics that are usually attached to that term, evil. Um, certainly, uh, behaviors like bullying, stealing from others, um, you know, not meeting your obligations uh, to the group. Uh, these things are pretty detrimental because at the end of the day, whether you believe that um, this is all created by God or you believe that it's a you know evolutionary process of some kind, uh, it is all about survival. You know, so as human beings, with the survival instinct, as they say, is super strong. And uh, in order to survive, you have to be able to cooperate with other people, and and there, there are certain things that are expected. Uh, and they're usually going to be, there's usually going to be a code of ethics, whether it's 10 commandments or other elaborations, uh, legal systems, which kind of define uh, what's permissible, what's not permissible, and things which are detrimental to the survival of a group are going to frequently be considered uh, to be not good. And those behaviors or, or things which promote the survival, the well-being of the group are usually going to be labeled good. But of course, um, it, it is very complicated in, in terms of uh, what, what actually happens. And I'll just give one quick example because it's always stated that there was a book I read, um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I, I, or long, you know, which was dealing with kind of the topic of evil. And, and one of the examples that was given was 
I, it was talking about a group of Japanese anti-war veterans, veterans from World War II. And uh, these were people who had been involved with the invasion of China and, and some pretty heavy duty mistreatment of, of people. And they had all sorts of rationalizations for it. You know, it's for the good of Asia, you know, East Asia. The, but but I, I remember there was this testimony from this one person in the group where he was talking about, he was in the military, low rank, you know, private, something of that nature. And uh, they were, you know, part of an in, invasion force into China. And uh, the sergeant was trying to condition the men to be particularly insensitive to the brutalities that were involved in the war so th with the invasion situation. And uh, he, he did, so he's talking to this group of anti-war veterans. They've all been traumatized. They've done things which they consider to be evil that they wouldn't have done in other circumstances and they have a lot of guilt. So they're sitting around, you know, kind of talking. And uh, this guy relates what happened with this incident where uh, he was, uh, they, they went into a village and they were going to be killing uh, people in the village just simply to dominate and intimidate and, you know, kind of take over. And he describes how this was the first time he had been in this, exact kind of a situation. And the sergeant or the officer basically told him to take, they tied a woman to a tree. And the uh, sergeant or officer told him to take his bayonet and kill her with the bayonet, not shoot her. And he, he said that he was shaking and that then the, uh, sergeant came over and started slapping him across the face and told him, uh, you know, essentially some version of you need to man up here and do what we do. And, and so he did go ahead and do it. He said he felt very sickened by it. But then as they repeated these kinds of barbarities, evil really in a, in a sense, um, uh, he, he became used to it, you know, in other words, he, and, and he said in, in this group, he said, I, I appreciated the respect that I was being given by my superior officer. And I appreciated the respect of the other men that I was able to do this kind of thing. So there was a certain reinforcement group, uh, reinforcement of this kind of behavior. And of course, in these kinds of situations, whether it's, you know, military situation or sometimes, you know, street gang situations uh, with men, and it's mostly men in, in these situations, uh, th this is a frequent dynamic. And uh, of course, you know, he was, one, once you get out of the, uh, uh, you know, situation and you have time to reflect, you might feel very badly about what you did. And of course, uh, you know, dur during the uh, Vietnam conflict, a lot, of, a lot of guys were PTSD. And, and the worst kind of PTSD was when you had committed some sort of barbarity that you never would have done under any kind of normal circumstance, but you went ahead and did it. And so, you know, I think that in sometimes evil in hindsight is being very much supported by all sorts of, you know, ideological justifications and just simply group pressure, you know, to be a certain way. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, that's super interesting. And it, it makes me kind of think about where did good and evil even come from if they weren't of nature? And I believe they come from the central authority's desire to control people through religion. Because if you create a general consensus of good and evil, then you can now manipulate the people to do what you've told them is good and to not do what you've told them is evil. So it's actually a pretty genius way to control people, which is how they've done it. One example, 
is in the Bible, actually. One of the Ten Commandments says, thou shall not kill, which actually goes completely against nature because if we didn't kill, we wouldn't be here. We kill animals to eat them just as we've always done. Every animal kills in nature. That is actually nature. And if two opposing tribes, and like think about hunter-gatherer people, two opposing tribes come together, they're obviously going to fight for dominance. That's also natural as well. So I think it's interesting how Stacy pointed out that evil is lived backwards. I wouldn't say it's necessarily against life. I would say it's actually like that for a, a reason. Well, okay, Daniel said thou shalt not murder is the more accurate translation. But even then, if, you, if somebody is threatening you and your family in nature, you should take them out or else they're going to take you out. It's like the story in the Bible of Cain and Abel. The lesson actually is that uh, Abel should take care of Cain before Cain takes care of Abel. But of course, th there's a reason why good and evil are once there, and it's to control people. And uh, this goes really deep, but what the general population considers to be evil are actually things that are good, so to say, if good even existed. And, and the way I describe it is, I think good and evil, good and bad, all of that have to come after you have your own personal value system established. Because what I think is good, Dan, for example, might not think is good. And is one of us right or wrong? Uh, no, because right or wrong also don't exist. It's you basically have your own personal value system, and then you can build anything you want off of that. So my personal value system, I value nature, the laws of nature. So anything that goes in with the laws of nature would be considered good for me, so to say. So in that sense, what most of the modern world considers to be good actually completely goes against nature and is less evil, if that makes sense. But yeah, I just wanted to make that connection to really think about where did good and evil come from and why is it a thing? And I do also want to welcome Mitch. We are talking about an idea that is good and evil do not exist. So I will put that idea in the chat if you'd like to look at it and then join in our conversation. Next up is Cesare. So um, Daniel, I, I really wanna thank you for uh, providing that example because it actually illustrates my point. Um, you know, I, I think the, so I, I have a specific idea about uh, really the ethics, the origin of ethics. It's, it's a part of my ideological profile. It's in the 23 point position. It's actually part of my fundamental philosophy. Uh, I, I shared that in the chat, by the way, the title of this idea is uh, nature of reality, human capacity for understanding of reality, mechanics of reality, ethics, rights, trust in politics. Ethics is the fourth section of this idea. And it starts out by saying that the idea of morality or ethically right or wrong actions is nonsense. Ethics is a matter of conflicts of interest and the question of which actions are ethically acceptable or unacceptable is decided by the interests of a particular group. And this is of course the subject to a very complex market dynamic. Ultimately ethics is, is is a it's a market it's, it's a product of, of various interests competing in a, in a market and those interests are based on the different drives of the constituent group and so in this idea i actually identify four different drives that are uh, or four four motives let's say uh, actually it's, they're not drives it's drives is more psychological here we're talking about motives um but ultimately, these different motives, they establish an equilibrium. And you know, you're talking about that soldier that was forced to kill this prisoner. Um, and his equilibrium was at a certain level uh, because you know, his empathy, and these are basically the, the main forces that establish an ethical system is one, reciprocity. Uh, second is, uh, Empathy, which, you know, commiseration, empathy, uh, compassion for others. The other one is community, which is the, your connection to other people within your group and understanding, the desire for intellectual consistency. So these, uh, yeah, so these, these four different motives are, are what establish an equilibrium. And basically what you're demonstrating here is that this soldier, his, his equilibrium was at a certain point 
you know, his empathy was preventing him and, and his, you know, intellectual consistency, it was, it, it created a certain equilibrium, but essentially one by, you know, well, actually in sense, forcing him to it, subjecting him to pain, but also making him using the group forces, you know, his, his desire for community with his group uh, they change those market dynamics in order to change his behavior uh, to make what he considered unacceptable to make that acceptable. And then it was reinforced by the group behavior of, you know, of them reinforcing one another in the horrible actions that they were committing. Um, but so, I, you know, like I said, I agree with this idea, good and evil don't exist. I mean, they can be they can be sometimes useful shorthand and, and a way to, to kind of, I mean, I sometimes use it in very non-philosophical settings, but I'm usually very careful to not actually refer to things as good and evil or moral. And I never use the words moral and immoral, just only to say that they're nonsense. But um, I think Actually, I lost track of what I was just saying. <laughs> uh, so, so anyways, uh, but um, yeah, so, so I think you, you illustrate that point. So that's, anyways, that idea, it's over there. I, I invited actually everyone here that I could to, to examine this idea in more depth. So you should see that in Igora, that invitation. I yield the floor. All right, thank you, Cesari. We'll now go on to Vilo. Well, I had a couple, you know, I, <laughs> you made a good, uh, you made some good points there. Um, you know, I kind of fundamentally agree with you already, Megan. I'm not sure if you ever read Voltaire. If you haven't, it's, I think you fall in love with that man. Let's put it this way. Uh, you're right. I mean, good and evil. I tend to think of these terms only from a moral point of view. Um, I don't think they actually have any value or any existence um to the world uh, or existence in reality reality just seems to be um and if we go back to actually where these terms come from well you can't really pinpoint i mean <laughs> these point this the, the good and evil thing actually you can hear a lot about them even going back to the pre-socratics who um use the terms really uh, more or less to define what they believe was the best way to live and and the and the shitty way to live so they saw bad things uh they, they would um his, you know heraclitus with his moderation the idea of moderating things never having too much pleasure but then not having now no pleasure is no good so um i look at it from that point of view um i don't really um uh, believe that these things again just like voltaire they just don't inhabit our lives or anything like that. I believe that the only, there is a fundamental morality to man. Um, he's unconscious of it, but I think that most people are become consciously aware of it. I believe it's self-preservation, uh, also known as egoism. It's fundamental. I think that everything that ramifies from there, all actions that come from, from that start are, can be ex uh, explained just from that point of view. Even, even suicide is part of egoism. It's an egoistic act. Um, there's a difference between egotistical and egoism, just so you know. So I really tend to believe that human beings root their morality at, the, at that level, at that core level. And that good and evil seem only to be a word used mostly, like, in, and you said it, in religion, used most commonly in religion, in a way to control or modulate what was uh, stable, what would stabilize society. You know, because I, I believe as Christopher Hitchens, that it was the first attempt of humans, religion of any kind was actually the first attempt of universal, or should I say maybe uh, uh, society control um, in order to maintain a, popu a populace uh, un that's, that's, that they known um, humans were unscrupulous. How do you maintain animals? How do you maintain them together without causing death and destruction and the, you know, the, the hell that might come with it, or maybe the complete 
um, just complete uh, eradication of humanity. And I think that this idea that you're, you, you know, that they, that they used of going to hell or having some sort of uh, eternal punishment or having some punishment of some kind for your deeds was a pretty ingenious way. It's almost like an internalized police. Uh, <laughs> and I think that it, it was good and evil was used in this way to really thwart any dissent or any type of issues that might have arise from the see troubles and um yeah i just think that it's it, it was just throughout humanity but I, I can't really pinpoint exactly i don't really know um where it came from so just some just, yeah that's really all i had to say i kind of i pretty much agree with you fundamentally i yield okay great thank you Vilo. i have not read any of voltaire so i will i will check it out thank you for that and thank you for your input i agree with a lot of what you said as well so we will go over to Daniel Tweet. You are up next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, on one level, I think what you wrote is is kind of poetic and it's it's nice. But uh, I mean, as far as like first principles philosophy, uh, we really don't know for sure. Uh, you know anything? Uh, we could be brains in vats, uh, as Vilo <laughs> pointed out. But that's not. You know, that's like saying this could be a simulation. That's kind of a stoner question, you know. <laughs> but I mean, I liked what uh, Sartre said. You know, didn't he say the only real philosophical question is whether or not to kill oneself? Uh, you know, and if you, that's kind of a first principle is like, you know, why are we here? Or why should we continue to be here? And you know, from what I've learned or noticed is, we haven't nailed down what consciousness is. I think it might be an emergency, an emergent property of just existence itself. And um, I think all learning experiences are good and there's nothing that can happen in existence that can't be a learning experience. So therefore all existence is inherently good on in this interpretation. I mean, you might have some learning experiences be more preferable than others, but um, I think that's kind of a useful uh, starting place to kind of deal with the idea of good and evil, which evil, which could be a useful category if you're talking about whether you or not you want to kill yourself, <laughs> I mean, there are things that will, you know, kill you faster than other things, and the things that will kill you faster are probably, you could call evil, and the things that extend your life could be called good. And um, I guess I'm kind of rambling there, so I'll just uh, yield the floor. Thanks. Yeah, that's great, General. I like what you just said that things that extend your life could be considered good, and things that don't extend your life could be considered negative or bad. And yeah, we. Maybe we can do another discussion about that. Or what is consciousness? What is reality? Are we in a simulation, so to say? But to keep on track with what we are saying, uh, so uh, something that was mentioned in the chat is, it aren't certain acts evil? The conclusion I come to is no. Even somebody, okay, we'll even use the Holocaust, for example. That's kind of, we all generally have the, that, that, that was evil. But understand that the Holocaust was just an action. It just is. It wasn't good or evil. It becomes good or evil depending on your own personal bias, what you put on it. Does Hitler think what he did is evil? Probably not. And something else I wanted to think about too is think about really what it's like in nature. And the closest you can get to it is watch videos of animals hunting each other. And that really gives you kind of an overview of what it's really like out there and how removed as a society we are. Because nature is by no means sunshine and rainbows or anything. It's pretty difficult out there. It really is survival of the strongest. And those who are the healthiest, the most intelligent, their genes reproduce and nature rewards that. And those who aren't, well, nature also punishes them and their bloodline will kind of go out. Now we can even look at, I think we're all aware that there is a cabal or cult that is in control of most of the population. But even then, are they necessarily evil? There's people who even say that they they drink the blood of babies. I'm, I'm not saying that's true or not. I don't know. There's no way I can actually prove that. But it's things that are talked about. And obviously, they have most people locked in cages. Now, is that evil? Well, we might say it is. But to them, actually, they're winning at nature. They're preserving their own bloodlines. They are literally consuming the highest vibrational foods ever. They actually are winning at nature. So in a sense, what they're doing for themselves is good. It's not good for most of the people who are stuck in that for the masses. But I guess the point being is that 
yeah, good and evil are also things that are created in the minds of man that we put, that we attach onto different circumstances. So also something food for thought to think about are the people that we consider evil who maybe kill or do something like that, are they actually deranged or are they, they more connected to nature than the average person here? Because we have to understand how disconnected from nature in reality more than 90% of the population is. And last thing too, that I wanna to touch on kind of something that Velo said, I loved is that morality actually is kind of a, now morals and ethics also don't exist, but there is a sense of, it's natural for humans to want to preserve their own bloodlines, their own family, the people that they love. So in that sense, also racism is natural, not the racism of the modern world. It's completely different. And I'll explain that. I mean, tribalism mostly. So it all goes back to the two conflicting tribes that the one tribe is going to do everything they can to preserve themselves. They will wipe out others if they have to, but they will always take care of their blood, their family, their tribe, and themselves. So that is natural. It is natural to love, care for, to protect, and not harm those that you have a connection with. In the modern world, we don't live in singleized tribes. We live in countries. So we have people of all different skin colors and backgrounds, and it's a beautiful thing. So I don't mean racism and, oh, we need to shield this person because they have a different skin color. That's not what I'm saying. I mean more of people that you have in your life that you love and connect with are usually the people that you protect and care for, which is natural, but it's not necessarily natural to care for somebody that you don't know or that you never have met. So once again, I'm, all, I'm referring back to nature and society is removed from nature. So there's a lot of controversies in that. But Darren, I know Darren is leaving us. Did he go? Is he still here? I think he left. Okay. Well. No, Dar this, Darren is here and I, I want him to speak before he gets out of here. Before. Oh, there's Darren, there's Darren. Well, Darren, I don't wanna make you speak or put the floor on you, but if you would like to, you may say a few words. If not, that's okay too. Whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, I wasn't prepared with any thoughts coming into this. I didn't even know the topic. <laughs> I didn't realize it would be such a big topic. I mean, this is like the hugest topic, right? Like yeah. whether good and evil exists, whether like what I've been saying, I, I have said quite a bit in the chat there. So I was asking things like whether like things we would generally consider heinous acts, even if we might not call them evil per se, like uh, torturing another human being or um, <coughs> excuse me, the rapist. Um, like we would, I don't know. I think, I feel like at least I have a strong sense that those things just like these, these things are pointless, right? Like if we're torturing someone, um, like there's no, there's no necessary, you know, it's not something that needs to happen in order for someone to live or have a life force or whatever, whatever you want to say. Um, at least I don't think so. And, uh, and if they do require it, then it's like, it's not essential. It's like, it's, it's something, it's an, it's some kind of evil pleasure they've acquired. And um, <laughs> like they've acquired a pleasure in something that's totally pointless. And unnecessary <laughs> um and um so i don't know i just feel like there's and i and so there was some discussion in the chat about whether you know they think what they're doing is evil they probably and maybe someone thinks they don't um i feel like i mentioned this must be this might be just an article of faith but i feel like they must have some sense that what they're doing is evil even if they're getting pleasure from it like, I, I don't know, I just maybe, maybe this is my own lack of imagination, but like, I just find it hard to fathom that you don't have any sense that when you're torturing someone. And I've, I've read some really, like, really bad <laughs> uh, examples of how people torture one another. Um, if, you, if you want an example, just Google what's happening in Syria's political prisons, uh, what's happening to political prisoners in uh, Bashar al-Assad, Syria. It's totally disgusting. Um, um and um unimaginable actually that people could do such things and um so um yeah and regarding like where evil is and where it comes from and how there's like all the pain and suffering in nature i don't know i feel like human beings were also somehow apart from nature in a way like i do feel like i do i do agree with what megan said that a lot of people are disconnected from nature like we just are right like we live we live, we're living on zoom we're talking on zoom we get our food that you know very sanitized ways 
uh, we are very, I totally agree. We are very disconnected. And, um, but I think even if we like return to nature in a way, we're always going to be a little bit apart from it. We're just different. And, uh, cause we have, we have different faculty of like thinking and reason. Um, that's why we're on zoom and, you know, the most advanced chimpanzees would never, <laughs> would never develop such technologies or, um, you know, write Shakespeare or whatever, understand Shakespeare. Um, and so maybe evil comes with that package, just that, like someone mentioned before that, you know, maybe it's something to do with our consciousness and how we have, because we have reason, we have this different kind of consciousness and evil is some kind of violation of that part of us, which is why it like feels different than just like, oh, you know, this is just bad for, you know, it's not just an act that somehow like, like I consider it bad because, you know, it, you know, because I lose out, like I lose money or like whatever, like I, I lose a little bit of something. So it's, it's more than that. It's like, it's like, I think evil is a kind of distortion um, or violation of our consciousness somehow. Like when you're, when you're, when someone's torturing someone or raping someone, it just seems like, I don't know, something, something has been broken there. That's more than just, oh, I you know, uh, like human beings need like, food from nature to survive and yes we kill animals and I like I wish we you know there was less of that and we didn't have to do that but there's there's something categorically different though like we do that because you know that's part of the cycle of nature but then when you're pointlessly torturing or or you know raping someone that's just like I don't know that's just like a different kind of break I don't know that's just different <laughs> so um anyway so that's my word I'm sorry that I went on a long time I'm sorry and um but this is basically just like, yeah, me saying on camera what I already sort of some of the stuff I mentioned in the chat. Um, I really do have to go. So I, yeah, I, I'll stick around for a little bit to hear people's responses. I think that's probably fair. I, I would hate it. Uh, but uh, yeah, but yeah, thanks for hearing me out. Thank you for explaining, Darren. We appreciate your input. And you don't have to apologize. You can say whatever is on your mind. That's what we are here for. So Cesari, your hand is up next. And then just so I can check before we move into closing remarks, Dan Bader, is your hand up or is it still up from last time? Okay. So you will be after Cesari. Okay, go ahead, Cesari. There is nothing more natural than the marketplace. Uh, in a sense, really nature or what we call, or what we think of as nature is really, they're just the results of the markets that, uh, that exist um the fundamental truth is supply and demand first there was stuff then that stuff came into created entities that wanted stuff and that created the demand for the supply that already existed so um well so that was the first point i wanted to make the the other point i wanted to make is um I look at ethics, I have a, an amoral concept of ethics. Uh, there is moral, and I, try, and I try very hard to make this distinction. Uh, that ethics is an overarching category over what people call morality or, you know, good and evil or right and wrong. But then there's also amoral ethics. And that's not even sp specific enough actually more specifically, I'd call it experiential ethics, ethics that's based on experiences, on the unconsciousness and, you know, subjective experience. Uh, because potentially there might be other forms of ethics that are not based on like, just experience. They might be amoral, but then they're not experiential. They might be something completely different. I don't know what it is, but I don't posit anything like that but there, it might be uh, something like that might exist. Uh, so, but whenever, and, and I'm very much, I, I think, you know, kind of like the original point was, uh, who was it? I'm trying to remember. I think it might've been Marcin. So, somebody said, I don't, maybe it was Megan. Somebody was saying that m morality is a way of controlling people. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think it is a way of controlling people but it's it's not i wouldn't say that it's a centralized way of controlling people i'd, I'd say it's like a um it's an 
intuitive it's more of an emotional way of controlling people it's like by calling something right or bad because like if you have like an apple like a good apple you can eat it and it will nourish you whereas if you have a bad apple it's rotten it will make you sick and same thing you know same thing with other forms of food when you when you have that term like everybody knows what a good apple is and what a bad apple is pretty much because you eat a lot of apples and other things, other, other foods. So, you know, that so good and bad take on a very strong connotation. And then in order to influence people who are committing certain actions, in order to have greater influence, greater sway over their behavior, people tend to call their actions good or bad because it kind of, harkens back to that concept of good or bad food or good or bad something else that's that's a, like vital for survival. So uh, I, it's essentially an abuse and exploitation of language, of the useful value of language to refer to ethical concepts as good or bad using terms that were previously used for practical things, practical matters. So it is, it is a form of like really abusing language and, and I don't think it's true. I mean, it's, it's just, it's abuse. That's what it is. It's not a reflection of reality. It's just people trying to be more influential. Later that became more codified into systems of ethics, systems of morality. And then certain people became experts in these fields. And then they would tell you, this is good, this is bad. And they would start to control you. So I think that came later on. As these ideas, you know, as pervaded society, then certain people, and usually it was like religious people who special, spe specialize in all kinds of other silly stories, then they became also experts of those stories. Uh, so that's where that came from. And, you know, as trying to fight nonsense as, as much as I can, uh, and again, basing it on supply and demand, I think these are bad concepts. I think we need to eliminate them uh, they're flawed concepts in case anybody's not clear what I mean by bad here. They're flawed concepts, good moral and or ethical good and evil are flawed concepts. That's what I mean by calling them bad. Uh, so I think we need to eliminate them, but the way that we eliminate them is again, coming back to the concepts of supply and demand. Uh, you know, people need concepts to make sense of the world. So if you don't give them better concepts, they're going to cling on to the to the lousy concepts that they have. So, you know, the idea that I, I was talking about earlier, uh, you can find it in Igora, 23 point idea in my ideological profile. I invite you to check it out because it's a much better way of looking at ethics. And um, it's, it's based on actually experience, on experience that we all share pretty much to some degree. And it's about you know, using market analysis to, um, you know, to, to determine what are the equilibriums within which we should function according to the experiences that we, that we have. I yield the floor, thank you. Okay, thank you, Cesare. We're gonna go to Dan, then to Marcin, and then we're going to move into closing remarks. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so here, here's some things to um, maybe clarify uh, some of the thoughts uh, that were recently put out there. So, um, you know, I, well, an anecdote. I, when I was working, I was sent uh, to a week long training to, to get me trained to work with sex offenders of all kinds, including rapists. And the guy who was one of the key, the guy who was the keynote speaker, his, his name, I can't remember his last, but his name was, doesn't matter. His name was Dave. And, uh, you know, he started his talk out with um, anybody who's been incarcerated out here in this, you know, rather large, would you please raise your hand? And maybe a couple of people did. Then he raised his hand. And then he relates the story of how he was, you know, coming up in, uh, he was from Brooklyn uh, and uh, went on about the trouble he got into and when he was incarcerated and so on. And, um, and then, of course, at a later point in time, he 
was able to obtain uh, a PhD in psychology, and now he was he specialized in sex offenders. Now, what and and in his talk, he gave an interesting breakdown of uh, psychopathy. And usually, you know, most people in in will will usually agree that somebody who's a psychopath is not a good person, right? Because they're they're totally motivated by they 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 see the world totally as predator prey. They're the predator; the rest are the prey. And their job, their their competition is with other predators. They want to be as high up in the you know, predator hierarchy, and they have no respect for the prey. They're just there to be taken advantage of and exploited. Uh, so, so Dave, you know, he, he kind of, he said, uh, and I thought it was interesting. He said, well, he, he would define, he would make a distinction between somebody who was a sociopath and somebody who was a psychopath. And he said, a sociopath is kind of like maybe your typical gangster. You know, they are able to have loyalty to their group, you know, their family, their group, but they don't, everybody else, they just simply see as prey, but they're capable of behaving sort of according to the group expectations, the gangster group. Um, and then he said, a psychopath is somebody who can't even do that. They may pretend to be a sociopath, you know, try to pass themselves off as they're loyal to the, you know, gangster group. But in fact, they will usually end up getting in trouble with the group and suffering the consequences because they really can't control uh, their desire to dominate. And um, so, you know, the, 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 it, it, what happened was, which was kind of amazing to me is so I, I really respected Dave, you know, I thought, wow, you know, that seemed interesting to me at the time. And also a lot of the information about sex offenders was valuable. But then at a later point in time, you know, maybe a couple of years after going to that, I, I saw in uh, a, a newspaper online that Dave had been arrested for an armed robbery with a couple of guys and, you know, he was, he had a, you know, fake beard on and everything. And I thought, wow, you know, what a psychopath in a way, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, here he was, again, kind of passing himself off as well. I was a bad character, but I reformed myself. And now I can, you know, share my wisdom of, you know, being reformed and what I learned. And yet there he is out there committing a certain kind of act that uh, obviously he obtained great gratification from, not that he was caught. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's, um, uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of people, in, and again, in, in the mental health world, the people who are, are defined as psychopaths are very difficult individuals because they really have to be brought out of you know, that kind of predator prey, and they're never going to change in a way. It's because it's very easy to become a predator in a lot of situations, you know, and, and it's there. And it's also uh, uh, easy to find prey or marks or whatever you want to call the people. Uh, but, but I think that, uh, you know, in most groups, uh, more primitive groups, you know, hunting gathering groups, one thing that could guarantee that your life was going to be cut short if you were too much of a predator within the group, you know, if you were a bully or you tried to steal from other people in the group, this kind of thing, you would not be allowed to go on. Particularly being, you know, sort of a dominant bully was, you know, again, that was a good way to say goodbye to living. And, and, and what was expected was fairness. You know, we call a lot of times we talk about justice and, you know, but fairness is a very basic thing. I think it's hardwired. And with that, within any group, we expect everybody to be fair, you know, and, and of course, a lot of ideological, you know, conflicts result over, 
you know, who gets to define what's fair? You know, in other words, uh, who gets to have what and what kind of control? How is that justified? And a lot of the challenges you have to make everybody believe that what it is is fair. You know, like here in the United States, for example, there's a big conflict right now between, uh, you know, sometimes people refer to it as equity in a sense that, you know, the outcome should be as fair as you can possibly make it, you know, type of a thing. And then there's the other argument that, you know, you should get what you get based on some kind of merit. And, and that's, a, you know, it's really a debate about what's fair, what's not fair. And, and I think, you, you know, that, that is something. Fairness is good. It's really hard to define exactly what it is beyond just the primitive fairness. If I have, you know, three pieces of food and there's three of us and I give you each a piece of food, we're pretty much okay, that's fair. If I try to keep it all for myself, I won't get a good, you know, my consequences will be pretty quick and unpleasant. And yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, and I, I guess, you know, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, take into account that some people, uh, to use what, actually Cesari, what, what you were talking about, you know, people who are able to be altruistic, have some empathy for other people, generally are gonna be able to cooperate within a group, whatever that group is, much more successfully than those who constantly seek to, uh, you know, as they say in some literature, you know, just free ride one way or the other. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. And last but not least, we have Marcin, you are up. Thank you. Um, so I'll try to make this quicker than everybody else. But uh, I'd like to piggyback on uh, Daniel's uh, fairness remarks. Um, I, I really don't find our system fair or anything. Uh, the, the, the way we logically think of fairness is fair. Uh, we should live in a society where, uh, where people contribute to the society and uh, where everybody's equal. And uh, that would be fair because we all know the end goal is to improve uh, society overall, not just our own existence. Um, but I raised my hand uh, for a remark that Cesari made about markets um, being natural. Um, there's really nothing natural about markets. Uh, the PR isn't natural. The advertising isn't natural. The money isn't natural. Um, like there's there's just nothing is natural about it uh markets are created by um by whatever you're pushing you could uh, you could set up a market on rarity and just uh, put out rare items and say all oh, these cost a lot because they're rare or uh you can i don't know have a blue t-shirt day and all of a sudden, it's a blue T-shirt day, market day. Um, I've I've never seen anything natural about markets, so I just wanted to retort that. Um, and that was about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marcin. I agree. As I put in the chat, the market is literally based off of people's beliefs, which is just perceived value. So it doesn't actually exist unless unless in your mind, if you hold value to that. Okay, very interesting discussion. We were able to take it many other ways. That's what I really appreciate about these conversations because we always get insight and it's really interesting to hear everyone's perspectives. So we are going to go ahead and move into closing remarks. So would anybody like to start us off? Or actually before, before we do that, I do wanna ask Cynthia, since you came in late, you can go ahead and I guess it can be a closing remark for you, but anything that you wanted to add or say, if you got a chance to look at the idea. Okay, go ahead, say whatever is on your mind. Well, I, I have a lot of thoughts, but I wasn't here for the whole conversation. Um, so, so what I had to say may not pertain to the conversation that was had, uh, but just reading the idea, uh, I mean, if, it, and, and I wrote in a chat for every thought that is thought there is an opposite aspect that the concept of good exists, the concept of not good also exists. 
uh, which, which to my mind would be good and evil, like those things must exist because we understand them to exist. Anyway, thank you very much. Just throwing that out there kind of high. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. Interesting perspective. Okay, Dan Tweet, I saw that you had your hand up, so go ahead and share your closing remarks. Yeah, you know, I, I think I want to speak in defense of the voluntary nature of markets, because that's what I think is the greatest part of it. I mean, either, either humans can interact on a voluntary basis or on a coercive basis. I mean, I go to the farmer's market and it's a great time. The people are there, they're happy, they're, they're getting their price for things that they made themselves and, and you're getting a fair deal on it. But yeah, when we start having a bad negative externality with how we treat resources and property, that's what causes all these, these other negative effects that, that people are talking about, like the scamola and the corporates and the, you know, the, the shenanigans and, the, you know, the, all that stuff. The but, profiteering. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, just if what, what is the optimal option besides people interacting voluntarily? I mean, to, to my mind, that's what's called generically the market. Because if it's not a, if it's not a voluntary market, it's some kind of tyrannical, you know, slave master relationship. And I, I think I think human action should be as cooperative and voluntary and and unrestrained as possible. You know, so that would be my my main uh, closing comment. Thank you so much, Daniel. Vilo, you are next. Yeah, I had um, written some things as. Um, yeah, I was hearing you guys talk. Um, I was kind of, it was kind of uh, a little, I was chuckling a little because the moment that Cesari said markets, I already knew he was going to get attacked. So I, I, <laughs> um, I was just going to just say something about what the whole good and evil thing, um, in my opinion, from the, uh, and I think I made comments about it earlier. Um, what I wrote here is uh, here is good and evil are fundamentally emergent concepts meaning they, de they derived from the conscious awareness of what and what doesn't function in sustaining everybody's self-preservation. As time progressed through observable trial and error, humans found intermittent harmony amongst themselves and were uh, fully aware that that sustainability was rooted in providing other humans with a satisfaction to their basic needs. Um, and happiness, I would include it was is a much higher form of needs. It's not basic. I think basics are more physical things that we need. Any act or form of thinking that threatened to destabilize even one person's self-preservation would be met with extreme prejudice. And I think good and evil and every system that was uh, invented by with human concept, because these are human concepts, um, was really, in my opinion, rooted in trying to keep the stability. And, and, and I personally, I think that for every person out there that commits a horrible crime in our view, um, there's always gonna be people who will always look at it in a different view. You know, like you were mentioning earlier, Megan, talking about Hitler. Um, the Holocaust was a horrible thing to many people, right? But not to the Nazis. And, um, you know, that's something, that's, that's a dichotomy that, why would it exist if there was actual good and evil, if there was something uh, really um, um, in, intrinsically true about that, intrinsically true about that moral, those moral aspects, then the Holocaust would have never happened. That just means that nature is separate from our human concepts, our human concepts. And um, I just, and again, it does, it does play a big role in religion um, for those very reasons. And I guess I derive everything back to the whole um, egoist um, point of view of morality. Uh, I tend to have a amoralist view as well. I think that as long as things don't threaten your self-preservation, they sometimes just don't matter. But I think that when the average person sees something that's horrible, they're looking at it from the point of view of, if I become indifferent to this, if I become indifferent to this act that somebody is committing, how would it ultimately affect me? I mean, we're all intertwined. We're all becoming more interconnected. 
as a society. So it's obvious that the greater majority of people are going to find killing someone a horrible thing because it affects us negatively as people. <laughs> so I think that, that that's basically the root, in my opinion, of where the root of good and evil come from. It's not something so much as a moral thing as it is a what will function to keep a, a society functioning and stabilize. So those are just my closing remarks, are you? Thank you, Vilo, very interesting points. We will now go over to Ilya. Would you like to share your closing remarks? discussion. I forgot what was I was going to say, but yeah, thank you. For... Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ilya, for joining us. Alex, would you like to share your closing remarks? Sure, yeah, I thought it was a really interesting discussion. Um, I think I, I, I've been moved from disagree to undecided, um, but I think my major sticking point is still is sort of appeals to nature and what is what are like fundamental mechanisms of nature. I think I agree that good and evil are not fundamental mechanisms of nature that would you know exist without humans being there. I liked what Daniel had to say about it sort of being an emergent property of consciousness. Um, and that being said, I think consciousness can be considered as a part of nature, but I think there's a lot left to learn in actually describing that rigorously. So yeah, thank you. Very well put, Alex. I agree exactly what you just said in your last sentence. So much more to understand about consciousness. And Cesari, you are up next. So one of the things I was thinking about is the utility of calling someone a good person or a bad person. Um, because I do refer to some people as good people and some people as bad people. It usually has more to do with someone being a good person rather than calling someone a bad person. Uh, but I think that's more of like a social uh, kind of concept. Like, you know, like you have a certain group of people and, you know, like this person might be bad for our group. Kind of like this apple might be bad for my body. Um, yeah, so, so you might see, you know, a certain group for, for the purposes of our group, our mission or for our society, our our group unity or you know, it could just be like a group of friends and you know some person they, their interests don't like really align they're, they're not going to be they're not going to be a good person for our party they're going to be boring or something or they're going to or they're going to drink too much and uh, they're going to be ridiculous so they might be a perfectly fine person they just might party really hard and you know so they might be too boring or too too fun uh, so you could evaluate people that way. Um, but ethics, ethics is more abstract than that. Yeah, it's more about, is this person good for the universe? Or is this person bad for the universe? Um, the point is, is that the universe doesn't care. So it's, it's all like a subjective or a relative evaluation. And there's nothing beyond that. The universe doesn't care about anything because the universe is perfectly fine the way it is. A horrible meat grinder. Thank you. I yield. All right. Thank you for your input, Cesari. Darren, would you like to share any closing remarks if you're still with us? So I, I don't have any, um, but I appreciated what, uh, I think, well, who was it? it was, I think it was Alex, the last thing he said about how much more we have to know about consciousness. That seemed very true to me. And uh, and maybe I, I'll put my, um, I'll put my bets that once we know more, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll find out that evil might be a real thing related to the fact of our human consciousness. But, you know, that's just a bit of faith, maybe. Thank you. 
Thank you so much again for joining us, Darren. We enjoyed having you here. Dan Bader, would you like to share your closing remarks? Yes, uh, you know, uh, I, I found it a very interesting, stimulating conversation and uh, really one worth having. And uh, uh, it is, you know, I, I just feel like at this point in time, uh, the categories of good and evil are being utilized by many, many people, you, you, you know, uh, in, in a very uh, embedded, strong kind of way. And, and it is really worthwhile to kind of unpack, deconstruct somewhat, you know, these, these categories to get a, a you know, a, a maybe more realistic view in how we view other people and how they view us. Uh, because uh, again, right now I, I see uh, the words good and evil being tossed around all over the place, you know? And as I said earlier, when I was doing the other, you know, when we make judgments, they're very reinforcing. It feels really good to judge somebody else. It doesn't feel good to get judged. And, um, you know, it, and, and it's, uh, but anyway, uh, again, a very interesting, worthwhile discussion. And Megan, uh, you know, one, once again, you really come up with some interesting topics, you know, and you never know exactly how they're going to go, but they are interesting. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I enjoy them as well. Thank you, Dan. Marcin, would you like to share your closing remarks? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'd just like to second everything Daniel said. Um, yeah, uh, words are just the, just you, uh, just, they're kind of used like people, like any, like, yeah, I'd just like to second what Daniel said. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, Marcin. And last but not least, Stacy, would you like to share any closing remarks? Yeah. Um, boy, there there was so much content. I didn't know exactly what I'd want to talk about, but I finally decided people have been talking about, well, are things good or bad? And we're basically going to judge them based on our own situation in our own community. Um, and I feel like we would come out so much better in this judgment of what's good and evil if we're going to do it anyway if we considered that we are all part of the same family and if we had balance holistic holistic principles that we're using to judge good and evil based on the the balance and viability of the whole the multiversal whole i think we could do a good job that way we just need to change our goals. And again, Megan, great topic, great discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stacey. And thanks to everybody for joining us and participating in the conversation. So just a show of hands, who is in agreement with this idea? Okay, so we have Vilo, myself, Cesari, Dan Bader, Stacey, and it looks like that's it. I know Daniel Tweed, you were kind of so-so before. So did anything change for you? Okay, still halfway. Uh, how about Darren and Marcin? Are you halfway or and Alex, or do you disagree entirely? Or you can abstain from voting in general. That's okay as well. Oh, I, I guess I disagree still. Sorry. That's okay. No need to be <laughs> sorry. And okay. I'm abstaining. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again to everyone. And this idea is in Agora. So if you'd like to add it to your ideological profile, please feel free to do so. I will put the link in the chat one last time and perhaps we can continue this discussion another time. Okay. So for our viewers and listeners, if you like this idea, don't forget to support it at agora-ilp.org. In the Agora, you'll also find information for our next meetings. And last but not least, like our page and join our group on Facebook, which you can find at facebook.com slash groups slash citizen assembly.